I think um, it's yes, time to start. Yes. And um, I want to say a very hearty welcome to the third day of the EFD uh, annual meeting. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to see so many uh, friends at these uh, various seminars. And um, today we have a very exciting plenary. It's my great pleasure to introduce John Steckel. He's a very good friend. He has a PhD in economics from the Technische Universität in Berlin. And he's also studied at the universities of Flensburg and uh, in Denmark, at the University of Southern Denmark. Uh, after that, he worked at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And now he's heading a working group on climate and development at MCC, the MacArthur Research Institute for Global Commons and Climate Change, which has um, really asserted itself as, as perhaps the uh, leading uh, institute for, for climate and environmental economics in, in Europe. Very exciting place. Jan has co-authored very many interesting academic articles. He is a IPCC co-author. Uh, he led a chapter on phasing out coal from uh, the UNEP emissions gap report in 2017. And together with uh, Somanathan and me, he leads the EFD initiative on emissions pricing, the emissions pricing for development, uh, which will have a meeting in session 4D tomorrow. So he will now speak on emissions pricing in low and middle income countries. And I will. Don't waste any more time. I'm very keen to hear you. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm very honored. Um, let me share my screen and then we can start right away. So I hope you all see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. And I want to uh, encourage anybody who has questions to write them in the Q&A function. Great. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk about emissions pricing in low and middle income countries, which is, uh, to me, a very exciting topic, a uh, topic that I have been working quite a bit. But I actually would like to focus on a very particular um, question in my talk. And this is actually, how do we make it work? And you might wonder maybe, okay, why is uh, this guy talking about emissions pricing in, in, in low middle income countries, right? Um, uh, arguably, uh, so we economists, we like when thinking about climate change and we come up with uh, this first best policy, let's price emissions, uh, let's give it the price that actually reflects the cost, the social costs of uh, carbon. And then if we look into uh, actually how developed countries fare, so this is a picture of G20 OECD countries, then we see actually, well, they do not really do their homework. So this graph actually shows you um, uh, how many of the global emissions are priced today in developed countries and G20 countries uh, at a level that would actually uh, be considered to be sufficient to, so to, to reflect the, the costs that we, we see in these uh, carbon emissions. And you see that only a very small amount, so 10% or so of like, these emissions are priced at a price that we consider adequate. So is it now fair uh, to call for emissions pricing in, in poor countries? If the rich countries do not make the homework. Well, I actually would like to make two points uh, why I think it is a fair question to ask. And, uh, and then I would like to go a little bit through uh, various aspects of my initial question. So how to make it work. So first perspective I would like to take is the climate perspective. So, 
you're all aware of this, and it is a very inconvenient truth that if you would like to achieve the climate targets that we have agreed upon in the Paris Agreement, so to keep global temperature warming uh, well below two degrees, then we only have a very limited amount of space left in the atmosphere to, to use the atmosphere as it is deposit for our carbon emissions. So depending on the climate target you assume, depending on various factors like the probability you would like to achieve, uh, this figure might vary, but I think it's fair to say that uh, around 800 gigatons uh, is approximately what we still can, can use. On the other hand, however, like we have a lot more stuff in the ground that we can burn, that we can actually deposit there in the form of coal, oil, and gas. And uh, it's a very simple truth. We need to make sure that what is in the ground is not um, actually going to be dumped in the atmosphere in the future. So let's have a look into the emissions. And I'm, I'm focusing uh, on energy-related uh, emissions here. Uh, that uh, today, 60% uh, of emissions uh, stem from low and middle income countries. And um, this is also where we have seen the highest growth rates. And by the way, um, we still see positive growth rates in uh, emissions. That means that every year we have to emit more than we did emit in the previous year. Another interesting perspective is the perspective of committed emissions. So, what is actually already, like assuming standard lifetimes of the capital livestock, what is already out there, what is already built. And here, like um, it's actually even 80% of those emissions that stem from low and middle income countries. This is, of course, neglecting any equity considerations, then, uh, because if you take a historic perspective, then it is, of course, developed countries that are responsible for the problem. But I think. We should, uh, we should leave this question aside for a second, and I will come back to it at the end of my talk, I promise. Um, so another inconvenient truth uh, is that in the past, at least, emissions, energy use, and poverty alleviation have been very strongly correlated. And um, um, then I would like to make the point that when it comes to energy use, we will probably have only limited possibilities to curb this. Uh, here's my argument. So this is uh, actually looking at households only, leaving aside structural change, energy demand that stems from industry, etc. But this is from a famous paper from Gatra at Al American Economic Review. And they, it is just a very simple table uh, but the point here is, uh, is, is very straightforward. It says, well, like uh, the energy using asset uh, ownership in the developing world is very low. If you look into India, if you look into Indonesia, it's less than 20% of the population that actually own these assets. At the same time, this ownership is, is a function of income. And uh, this is from our own work where we did this for all kinds of countries. And basically, this graph shows you the probability of owning a fridge in India uh, across uh, all uh, household uh, incomes and expenditures. And the red solid line here now shows you where we have been on average in the year 2012. That roughly corresponds to the number that you see here on the left hand side. This is where we expect the average uh, household expenditure to be in 2030. So you can see that in the next 10 years, we will very likely see uh, that a lot of Indian households will start to buy these energy uh, using assets. And it's not only the case in India, it's actually the case in many uh, low middle income countries. So I do not expect a lot to change in these dynamics. Of course, if something can be done, efficiency improvements, et cetera, to bend this curve. But in the end, I think it will be very important to think of how this energy will be provided in the future. Will it actually follow a business as usual path uh, on the left, a picture from, uh, from Turkey that heavily invests into uh, very dirty uh, and emissions intensive coal? Or will our future look more uh, like the right? And 
uh, like the right hand side of the picture. And if we want to get anywhere close to the two degree or one point five degree target, we should make sure that it looks a little bit more like this. I think it is important to understand the baseline a little bit. Where are we? So I've talked about electricity use, electricity access. Uh, so in the past, what we have seen is that increasing quality of electricity access, hence then related to increasing ownership, energy consuming assets, et cetera, et cetera, has come also with a massive increase of emissions. So this graph is from a systematic review we did with uh, Mark Jones uh, and uh, colleagues, uh, where you see that if we just look into like very low quality of access, then indeed we find in the literature that emissions are very low. But if you look into higher tiers, into actually like the tier three to five, where people really have access to electricity, to a uh, long uh, span of the day, with a sufficient quality, et cetera, then it looks very different. And by the way, this is independent of on or off-grid electrification. So it um, means that as soon as people use more electricity, have like these more energy consuming assets, then emissions in the past have also come up. And this is the household side of the story, then there comes the industry side, etc. that I do not have time to dig into. But what I would like to show you is this, that a lot of countries expand their grids. A lot of countries actually invest into this infrastructure. And this today still often means that they invest in coal. So despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we still see that global coal investment increase or hold at a relatively high level. Um, and those plans, and this actually graph comes back to the budget graph that I showed you at the very beginning, showing in yellow and orange actually the ranges of emissions that we still can put into the atmosphere when um, we aim to um, achieve those targets. And you, you see that like the, now looking into the committed emissions, so what is actually already there, without coal already scratches at what we can do. And then when we add um, coal, then you can see that like these budgets are actually exceeded. So we need something to not only disincentivize the right hand side here of this picture, so the plants and the construction plants and shelf, which by the way you, you see are mostly driven by uh, new industrialized countries, but also in this graph here to bring down actually or to, to, yeah, to, to make sure that those plants do not run until the end of their lifetime. And this is something that the carbon price could achieve. The second uh, perspective would be an economic one. And so this is that a CAM price is actually a quite nice means to increase the tax base. So we know that low and middle income countries typically tax relatively little, which then also gives them relatively little levy to uh, invest publicly in the infrastructure needs they, uh, they have. Um, the nice thing with carbon taxes or carbon pricing in general is that it can cover the informal sector quite nicely. Um, because also, be it informal or formal activities, they need to kind of uh, buy electricity, gasoline, natural gas, etc., to operate. And then, as a side argument, uh, like uh, literature says that actually, if we do this, if we actually find that people substitute from formal services to informal services in this case, uh, which again uh, has a rather improving aspect. And these gains or these um, revenues that could be uh, that could be gathered are quite substantial. So this is uh, actually from the IMF that calculated how high these um, revenues could be. Uh, and they, in most countries, there are somewhere, depending, of course, on the, on the, on the price, but the, uh, on, on the level of the price, there can be between two, three, four, even up to six, seven, eight uh, percent of GDP, which is quite substantial. You might argue, well, if I put forward this tax, then I actually put forward a tax that actually will reduce, or my revenues will reduce quite quickly. Well, this could be somehow counterbalanced by um, kind of an increasing uh, rate over time. 
And the nice thing again is that these revenues might be used for whatever, but uh, for example, for lowering other distortionary taxes, for funding public investments, and also to support those that are disproportionately affected uh, by this price, be it workers, be it communities, be it households. Well, now you might say, well, okay, but this is still a quite theoretical argument because nobody is actually considering a carbon price in low middle income countries. Well, this is not really true. Uh, this map shows you actually the plans as we speak today, uh, countries that aim uh, to uh, have a carbon price sometime soon, and you see that it is uh, quite a few low middle income countries that are actually considering it. And as they consider it, they also ask questions. They ask questions, how can we actually do it? And this is uh, what I would like to focus on now. So. For sure, we can say that kind of a carbon price that will also very likely rise energy prices has the potential to trigger political resistance. And I just collected a couple of pictures of examples where not a carbon price, but a fossil fuel subsidy reform has caused major um, public conflicts, be it in Indonesia, Ecuador, Iran, or uh, in Nigeria. Uh, and those protests uh, often had the power to stop the reform. So this is, of course, something that we want to avoid. Um, and however, we need to be aware that if we go forward with it, there are interest groups that lose from those reforms and that can be expected to lobby against it, be it energy users, brokers, fossil fuel owners, industries, specific regions. Um, and it is um, very important in my eyes to think a little bit how these protests could be alleviated. And there's a huge literature um, actually on the question how these reforms can actually be uh, made effective and what is decisive. And one quite clear answer is that these reforms need to be perceived as fair. Um, and this literature also has worked out some guiding questions that can guide us towards the question, how can we make this um, perception of the carbon price or how this carbon price being perceived as fair? And those are like, who is affected? How do we use then the revenue? Is it actually going to the general budget? Is it reinvested? Is it transferred to particular vulnerable groups? Um, but also what are the social norms, political culture, what is the institutional background of the country? Um, how do these policy reforms impact individual freedom? And also one point that is often made is how salient are these um, policy changes? Then very important, of course, is that is it an effective policy and is it an urgent one? So um, given other uh, obviously important policy objectives. What I will do now in the next 20 minutes or so is trying to go through these questions and provide some answers to how these play out in a particular context of low and middle income countries. Uh, acknowledging that this will not be it, I think it's rather the start of a journey rather than the end. So let's have a look into the question who is affected. So we economists often basically, when looking into this question, ask the question, okay, is this reform progressive, so pro-poor, or is it regressive? Um, well, um, often you hear, well, the carbon price is regressive. Um, this is not necessarily true. So we just uh, published a meta-analysis of the literature covering 53 studies in 39 countries, and we can actually find one very interesting finding that particularly in lower income countries, the actual literature finds more progressive results. So indeed, like these results of the carbon price being regressive is often found in developed countries, where the contrary is true in low middle income countries. Um, we also find that independent of the um, the income level and transport sector policy is um, more 
uh, progressive if we include additional economic effects, um, for example, behavioral effects, generally tourism effects, lifetime income effects, we find uh, more progressive results than when just looking into the incidence. And um, maybe one aspect that is important to highlight that there is no, and this is expected, there's no difference whether we look into a, a carbon price or a fossil fuel subsidy reform, because basically it's the same, right? Like a fossil fuel subsidy reform just removes the negative carbon price, if you like, um, whereas the carbon price then makes it positive. We can confirm this finding by looking into some data. So um, we did a study where we um, harmonized, or we looked into a harmonized data set, looking into 87 countries and looking into the effect whether the poorest, um, uh, in this case, actually, this is people with a daily average uh, consumption lower than three US dollar, whether the poorest are more or less affected than the average in a specific country. And we do find that for this broad set of low middle income countries, and with a few exceptions, uh, the effects would be uh, progressive. Well, I'd argue, however, if we are interested in the question who is affected, this is not yet getting us where we would like to, to, to go. Because whether something is progressive or regressive is interesting to know, but it is not necessarily decisive if we are interested in, know, in how to make those policies acceptable. Um, this graph is a little complicated, but it shows you on the y-axis the income centiles um, of Colombian households and how they would be affected in terms of a wealth loss and percent of income by a $40 um, carbon price. You, you see, if you look into the mean here or the median, that the effect would indeed be regressive. So the poorest here would be more affected than the richest. But my point is a different one. My point is that look into this huge spread. So even if we look into the mean or the median, we miss a lot of households that might actually be affected very tremendously. Um, um, and I think this is very important to consider. And um, in the same way, like showing the same map as before from the same study that actually shows us progressive results, this is actually how uh, the households would be affected in absolute terms. So um, and you can see that in quite few countries, we see that the lowest income group would be affected by more than 2% uh, percent of their income, which is, of course, um, which can be tremendous. And the important question that I think we uh, need to answer is, what does it then mean for development indicators? What does it mean for food? What does it mean for energy use? One important question is, um, uh, in, low, in the context of low-middle income countries, so if we price carbon, what does it actually do for uh, cooking fuels? If, we, if households use actually a lot of charcoal firewood, and we are maybe very proud that we uh, we have thought of policies and measures that they uh, finally use, or that they can use different uh, fuels. What actually then does a, a fossil fuel price hike mean? The literature gives some hint that this may actually lead to increasing biomass collection in uh, Tanzania and in Senegal. And uh, I'm actually debating this often with my friend, Jeff Peters, who provided me with this graph, said, okay, look, yeah, this is what happened in Senegal after fossil fuel subsidy reform. Before, a lot of people used LPG, and then we had the reform, and an increasing amount of people uh, used charcoal and fire. And this is, of course, something that we do not, or that we should avoid, right? So, because it has comes with negative health impacts, uh, it adversely impacts human labor supply, it impacts women's time use, it has all these negative development implications that uh, we would like to avoid. And it might, in addition, potentially drive forest uh, degradation and hence actually be uh, bad uh, for the environment and for climate change uh, in the end. Um, in the study with, uh, at MCC, led by Ravi Agarwal, by the way, she's presenting this tomorrow in detail, um, we looked also into the effects on food consumption. And 
in Uganda, actually, we have, from just looking into the um, distribution impact, we have a progressive result. But we also find, um, using a, a demand system here, we also find that carbon pricing creates a shift in the food basket and leads to less nutritious diets, and particular for the poorest. Again, it's something that we want to avoid. Note that these results always um, disregard that we could recycle uh, revenues. And I think this is very important to look at. How could this actually be done? So the literature um, is quite broad on, on how revenue recycling can increase political feasibility and acceptability, um, looking into various forms that can broadly be classified into kind of um, uh, reducing other distortionary taxes, taxes on labor, taxes on capital, etc., or transferring um, parts of the revenues either to particularly vulnerable uh, groups or just uniformly um, um, uh, through, the, uh, through the population. The question is, is that all feasible in a low middle income context? And I think it requires some careful thinking, um, not if, but how this can be made. Um, we can actually observe that many low middle income countries have quite a few experience with using some kind of transfer schemes. And these can, of course, be used to um, also in the climate context. One example I'd like to introduce to you is um, colleagues from MCC and um, the American Development Bank looked into the case of Ecuador. Ecuador was actually reforming the fossil fuel uh, subsidy reforms last year, and the colleagues, it actually went pretty pretty bad. Uh, so people went to the streets, and uh, in the end, the reform was taken back. But um, so colleagues actually looked into the question okay, can we use the existing uh, conditional cash transfer program, the, the BDH, um, to actually compensate people? And this is now just looking into into the diesel effect. So what we see in red would always be the uncompensated effect. So you see, well, uh, people would be affected. It would even be slightly regressive. But then using the existing scheme to compensate people. Option one, uh, just use the existing scheme and um, uh, scale it up. And you can see, well, it could actually already compensate uh, the poorest and make the entire policy progressive. Could then, of course, also think of expanding the applicability of the existing scheme and um, make it uh, even more strongly progressive, also fully compensating it uh, for the up to the third uh, quintile, um, or uh, even looking into a totally different channel, which was, however, discussed in Ecuador, which could actually compensate at least an average 80% of the population. Um, I think that this is a very interesting route and very interesting questions that need to be answered if we think of carbon pricing, because it can actually give us a hint how we can make it acceptable politically and also uh, for uh, people living in, in those countries. Another way, of course, and this is something that is not so much discussed in the actual literature, is that we can also use the revenues to finance other societal goals. And in the context of low-middle income countries, like the uh, a very um, yeah, prominent idea would be to use the revenues to finance um, other goals formulated in the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda 2030. Um, in the paper a few years back, we actually calculated the revenues from a carbon price and fossil fuel subsidy reform and contrasted it uh, by the cost that uh, uh, the, the public investment needs that uh, would uh, be there in countries to cover the entire SDG agenda. And we find that in particular in the more, let's say, uh, a little bit richer countries like Indonesia, um, uh, Vietnam, uh, also India and Pakistan, like these revenues could cover like nearly 100% of the entire investment needs, public investment needs for the SDG agenda. It looks a little bit different in sub-Saharan Africa, simply because first emissions are very low and second also the gaps 
uh, of achieving the goals are wider. But still, I think it is an interesting uh, idea that we can have in mind. And then the question, of course, appears, how does that play out in terms of distributional effects? And we calculated this uh, for Nigeria and compared these uh, investments into infrastructure to uh, regular lump sum transfers. And um, we find that if you take the revenues and, and use it to improve the access to water, to sanitation, electricity, it would be much, it would be even more progressive and very beneficial for the poorest part of the population, uh, and even more uh, progressive than a lump sum transfer. Um, I skip this slide, and um, would like to come to my next point, and this is the point of uh, social norms, political culture, and institutional background, which is of course very important to understand. Let me give you an example of India. India is a federal country, um, so if we just look into aggregated effects, then I think we miss a very important part of the story. So we looked into um, employment effects, because of course, like if you look into distributional effects on households, this is not the end of the story, right? Like uh, regions will be affected differently, maybe workers will be affected differently, all kinds of, you can basically tell the story for you know, multiple dimensions. Here we looked into employment, because one narrative that often prevails, people who basically say, yeah, let's have an energy transition, and uh, yes, all these jobs in the fossil fuel sectors will be lost, but we will also gain a lot of other jobs. Okay, this might be true, um, but it is not necessarily true that the jobs that are lost or gained are also actually lost in the same region. So for India, for example, where we can expect jobs to be lost in the coal sector would be more in the eastern regions. Uh, that where we do not necessarily expect a lot of new jobs uh, coming in in the solar and, and wind sector. So this would rather be actually in the northwestern or even in the southern and southwestern states. So there's a mismatch. And of course, uh, these regions being important in the policy process, they have an incentive uh, on the regional level, the state level, to, to lobby against it. Let me say a word on social norms, a little bit independent of this. And this is from an experiment we did at MCC, um, where we actually wanted to know whether there are kind of preferences for a specific policy instrument. So basically, uh, we did a lab experiment with people and asked them to throw chickpeas. And um, then another participant had to clean up. It was more efficient for, the, for all participants, actually, if the uh, if the participant who threw the chickpeas let the other one clean up. But it turned out that people were really willing to, to sacrifice on their income up to 20%, except real economic losses, if they do it by themselves. And the implication, I think, is that in this case, and we did a lot of sensitivities and linked it to emissions trading versus um, carbon pricing. And here, like in, in this group of people, so this is German university students, but, but and it might look totally different in other contexts. But I think it is very important to consider that there are like these norms, these, these social, moral issues that might differ from society to society, which can stand in the way uh, towards one or the other instrument. Um, again, let me skip this in the interest of time and come uh, to the next question. And this is the, the question in the impact of individual freedom salience of a policy. I'm saying this because there is a quite vivid debate um, of people saying, well, we should not have carbon pricing. This is a nice idea in theory, but people do not like it. They don't accept it. Let's work with other policy instruments. Let's work with standards, for example. And one argument is, that is made is that the political cost for setting um, the standards are lower than for a carbon price. Um, a key channel here is that they might be less salient. If I put a price on carbon, then it is 
very visible everywhere. It increases the cost of energy across the uh, across the board. Um, the incidence um, is, is there, and if it, it's a pretty high tax, then it can be, uh, as I have shown before, quite substantial. And people argue, well, if you do it by standards, maybe kind of uh, on the vehicle fleet or in the electricity sector, then it is less salient. Um, However, on the other hand, we know that the mitigation costs of achieving a given goal by standards are usually higher. And so we can actually play around with this a little bit. And I would argue, uh, inspired by my colleague, Mike Jacob here, that if we only look into very small changes, if you look into very small levels of mitigation, then this might, true, might be true. But um, if we go towards like the reduction target that we look at, then this might look very different because uh, then we also need uh, basically standards that are prohibitive. Uh, and I think this, uh, uh, this can increase the political cost faster of a standard than it does for, for a carbon price. And don't make the mistake to think that kind of a standard doesn't have any distributional implications. I think this is sometimes in this debate a little bit overlooked, and there is now an emerging literature that shows that at least energy efficiency standards in the US are more regressive. Uh, we also looked into this in the case of um, various um, Asian coal investing countries here uh, for Vietnam. In this graph, the relative household burden um, for various income quintiles is normalized to the first quintile. So if you have something that's positive, then it's a progressive outcome, negative, or sorry, uh, not positive, but higher one is uh, progressive and lower one is uh, regressive. And in the case of Vietnam and many other countries, including Indonesia and including India, we find that uh, actually a tax is uh, more progressive at least than a standard, or as in this case, uh, a tax would be progressive, a standard would actually be regressive. So, this leads us to the question of effectiveness. I mean, we could actually think of a very nice tool, such, a com such as a carbon price, and then we find, wow, like the, it is not effective in the end. Well, generally, when looking into the literature and looking into what carbon prices did in the past, we find, yes, they have been effective. This is from a recent paper by Best uh, and other Australian colleagues who basically looked into countries that had a carbon price in 2007 and one that didn't have a carbon price in 2007, and how the CO2 emissions growth has uh, developed. And they find that it had an effect actually in bringing down those emissions. However, um, this is, of course, a sample of developed countries. So we might ask, what are low middle income country particularities that uh, could actually change this? One, I think that is very important to look at is the question of capital cost. So this is a tremendously complicated graph, I know. Um, what it shows is actually um, the uh, carbon price and weighted average cost of capital. And the contour lines that you can see are the shares of renewable energy following a particular model. I do not want to go into the model. It is uh, actually in electricity market model that is calibrated on the Chinese uh, province. So coal plays a huge role here. But I think the, the general dynamics is, uh, is quite easy to understand. If we introduce a 40 uh, uh, US dollar carbon price in a country where like weighted average cost of capital are very low, this can actually lead us to a share of low carbon uh, emissions in uh, low carbon technologies in this model uh, at 30 percent. If we apply the same level of the carbon price at a country with uh, 10 percent, then we can expect only uh, like uh, a 10 percent share, so significantly lower. And here, actually, the share of the uh, of renewable energy is directly proportional to emissions. And uh, let me just show you um, where we are in the real world in regarding uh, weighted average cost of capital. You see Germany at the very left, so close to zero, 2.5. If we, we can get capital very cheaply, uh, risks are low, um, uh, regulations are pro-renewables, etc. 
But if you go into Vietnam or India, uh, then this looks very different. And the reason why this is, is that we have between um, the alternatives that we would like to trigger, renewable energy, for example, but it's also the same for, for other forms of energy, we have very different uh, financing cost structures. So with fossil fuels, a lot of the costs, if you decompose the life cycle cost of electricity, are actually in the operating expenditure. So they occur sometime in the future. Whereas for renewable energy, it is basically, most of it is upfront. So a high share of capital uh, costs or a high capital cost actually uh, hurts renewables much more than it does uh, uh, for fossil fuels. So uh, this actually might be one angle of attack where we might need additional um, instruments and maybe also instruments that we do not think of too much in the context of developed countries. The second is that um, we have seen that coal plays such an important role. And the question is, why do countries invest so much into coal? There are alternatives available. And every time I show the slide, people tell me, yeah, but renewables are so cheap, they are so cheap. Yes, it's true. They have become much cheaper. But it might actually be that um, there are other externalities, spillovers to coal investment that we often overlook. Spillovers to industrialization, spillovers to um, uh, infrastructure development, for example, historically it is quite clear that in uh, industrializing UK, coal had a large effect on bringing down transportation costs by actually triggering the, the construction of um, uh, canals and, and railroad lines. And using actually a global panel ranging from 1960 to 2014 with, with uh, uh, sub-national GDP rates, uh, subnational GDP data, we actually find quite some evidence that coal indeed leads to higher GDP on the region level. It is difficult to claim causality here. There are all kinds of issues, but I think it is very important to think of this and to next to the right, and I haven't talked about this, but next to the, 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 the great literature of people making the points about co-benefits for health, for all kinds of things, I think we need to think of, really think of uh, also the, the coal costs and how we can tackle them. So, for example, do we need additional industry policy options to facilitate energy transitions and, and really make it possible for, the, for low middle income countries to um, go in this direction? So, I'm nearly done. Um, um, this point, I think, is quite obvious. Is, is it actually the most urgent topic for uh, policymakers and societies in the global south to think of climate change mitigation? Or are these different topics? I think this is a very fair question to ask. Uh, let me come back to what I promised you at the very beginning. This is the question, how can the international community be involved? Because, of course, uh, there is a huge um, equity, international equity dimension, Thomas. Uh, two minutes. Uh, I, yeah, I, <laughs> that's a huge uh, uh, dimension. And this actually, uh, I think we need this support. The question is how we can do it. So, this is basically how the Green um, Climate Fund that uh, has promised to spend 100 billion US dollars and, and put it into, uh, um, yeah, into the facilitation of the uh, energies, etc., in the global south currently works. It basically provides funds directly for specific projects that are both somehow related to climate, mitigate, climate change mitigation and sustainable development. I think we can reform this a bit and think of what can we actually do and what do we need to do to incentivize actually the right policy instruments, be it carbon pricing, be it additional policy instruments uh, that countries can use. And in the case of a carbon price, this has, as I argued before, the nice uh, side effect that it can raise revenues. These are national, they can be spent on whatever kind of goals a particular country has. And I think it is really uh, timely and important to think a little bit to make these international structures um, uh, or to design them in a way that they both, that they fulfill the uh, target to both help countries um, to not locking in or bringing down their emissions and at the same time fostering 
um, climate change mitigation. So let me summarize. I have argued that carbon pricing in low and income countries mm -hmm. can be justified from a climate and an economic fiscal perspective. That it is most likely progressive, but uh, revenue recycling is still necessary to protect vulnerable groups of the society. That we will very likely need additional policies to make um, the carbon price effective, and that we still need international support. But there are still a lot of many open research questions. And as I said before, I think this is just the start of the journey and not necessarily the end. Uh, so, what we did. Uh, together with Commerce and some and others, we have founded like this Emissions Pricing for Development Initiative here at EFD, where we would like to look into all of these questions, the political acceptability of carbon pricing, the competitiveness, the economic growth question, how a carbon price can mobilize domestic resources, what are the roles of fossil interest lobbying and projects of coal, and how do we set optimal carbon prices, a topic that I haven't talked about uh, in this talk, but which is of course also very important. If you're interested, just visit the website or reach out to us, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Yeah, It was a very interesting and a great talk. So uh, we have a couple of uh, questions. I'll try to move qu quickly here and uh, let Elina Shea from uh, SIDA ask the first question. Yeah, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed the rich presentation that covered a lot of topics and I appreciate, uh, especially appreciated the focus on, on the people living in poverty. My question was uh, on the relevance of the findings in times of the global pandemic and COVID-19, whether you think that the view of the decision makers uh, have changed at all, uh, considering their appetite to take in popular choices uh, in order to achieve uh, development outcomes and save lives, which uh, climate uh, mitigation would would do. Do you see any uh, possibilities to a more positive uh, and bolder development in the future? Thanks. Um, great question. Um, so I think it's a little bit too early to call. Um, um, I think what we see, though, is that we need some um, some government intervention, some role of the state to get these things done to solve the problem. Right? If you look into how it evolves uh, globally, and if you look into those countries that actually have managed to deal with COVID-19 successfully. Um, then I think that they have one thing in common, and that is the relatively strong government that really dare to intervene and, 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 and push through some, at this time, maybe also unpopular policy uh, policy actions, and they, uh, they were quite successful with this. So it might be that this is one of the outcomes. The second one is that I think uh, that what we also see is that, uh, that this pandemic proves again that we are basically all on the same planet or on the same boat, right? And that, that there is a lot of kind of, um, I know that this, uh, given a lot, a lot of the discussions were maybe a little bit overshadowed by the US election and et cetera, but I think that in general, we might, um, we might see this as the beginning of new negotiations of uh, international cooperation. Thank you so much. I, I want to rush a little bit. Uh, we have one time for one or two more questions, and Som uh, is going to ask the next question. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Jan, for a great talk. Um, so my question, I have two questions. Um, the first is, what do you think of political feasibility as a function of how gradually prices increase? And my second question is, for political feasibility, shouldn't carbon pricing come after countries have first taxed their local pollution appropriately, um, especially if we rule out abrupt price or tax increases on grounds of political feasibility? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
in terms of basically credible increases, I think it can um, increase not only the acceptability, but it can also uh, increase the effectiveness of the instrument. Because one aspect that I haven't talked about much is kind of like, of course, the CAM price can only be effective if, it, if it's also deemed to be credible by the market actors, right? And like actually coming forward with, with a very clear kind of, um, let's say, escalation of the price might be uh, one way to ensure like this credibility thing, for example, of some kind of a, a fixed trajectory of the minimum price in an ETS if the country wants to use an ETS. Um, in terms of the second question, um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, um, I think it's a great question. Like I, I think I would need to think a little bit more about this, whether necessarily like um, kind of pollution control needs to come first. I mean, I mean, you can also think of this a little bit in parallel, given kind of the probably large, and I mean, there's a huge literature uh, like showing that there are these huge co-benefits of climate policy also tackling pollution. Um, whether then we need kind of a, a sequence of policies first tackling air pollution and then going for climate policy, I don't know. But uh, one final point on this I would, I would uh, say is that I would assume that if countries address their air pollution uh, problems, there would at least be also some kind of uh, spillover uh, for the climate, right? Because, I mean, of course, you can tackle air pollution differently. But I think there would still be some uh, some reduction, some slowdown of of growth of emissions. Thanks, thanks so much. We'll try to squeeze in a little bit more. I, I I'd like to just note that uh, uh, Francisco Alpisa had a similar comment uh, on, uh, or perhaps an angle on this uh, local pollution, uh, saying that very often. The, uh, you can see the local reduction in pollution as a co-benefit and that, that can facilitate policy. Uh, I'll squeeze in also Susie Kerr, um, thanks for your presentation and uh, particularly wanted to um, say that she um, was thinking about Article 6 funding and even large purchases of offsets could also be support. And uh, she was wondering if you had any thoughts about, about offsets uh, in, in this context. Um, yeah, I agree. Like uh, Article 6 and offsets can be a, a, a great, uh, great vehicle here. Um, I have to think, I always, have, when I'm talking about like this huge amount of offsets that we're talking about, I always have to think of some work that we did in the past couple of years back where we actually looked into the, the amounts of inflows and uh, they can be very substantial and of course needs to be made sure that they also can be absorbed. Uh, but in general, yes, I think it has huge potential. So thanks very much. I think uh, we have kind of been instructed to end the time and so I'd uh, a few one or two housekeeping uh,